And now we are privileged to have a fine uh, array of panelists to appear before this uh, subcommittee. And we want to thank them beforehand for taking the time out from their busy schedules to make this first appearance before the 100th and 11th Congress on this particular issue. Uh, I'm going to introduce the members first, and then we'll ask them to uh, have uh, opening statements for five minutes of opening statements. Uh, to my left, to your right, uh, Mr. John Stevenson is the Director of Natural Resources and Environmental Government Account of the Environmental Governmental Accountability Office, uh, GAO. Uh, Mr. Stevenson has been the Director of the Environmental Protection Issues within GAO's Natural Resources and Environment Team since to October 2000. Seated next to him was, is Mr. J. Clarence Terry Davies. Senior Fellow, Resources for the Future. <clears throat> Mr. Davis was an EPA Assistant Administrator for the Policy in the Administration of President George H.W. Bush. Seated next to Mr. Davis is Ms. Maureen Swanson of the Healthy Children Project. Uh, and she's the coordinator of Learning Disabilities Association of America. I see it next to Ms. Swanson is Cecil Corbin Mark, who's the Deputy Director and the Director of Policy Initiatives for We Act for Environmental Justice. And that stands for the West Harlem Environmental Action uh, Group. Uh, and Mr. Cecil D. Corbin Mark is a lifelong resident of Hamilton Heights in Harlem, New York, where his family has lived for the last six decades. Seated next to him is Mr. Michael Wright, who is the Director of Health and Safety for the United Steelworkers. Uh, with that, with those introductions, we would ask the panel to begin now with the opening statements. And please limit your opening statements to five minutes. And please pull the microphone directly in front of you as you speak. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to be here today to discuss our work supporting the need to improve the Toxic Substances Control Act. The Congress passed TSCA, as many of you have mentioned, in 1976 to enable EPA to obtain more information on the risk of commercially used chemicals and to control those that EPA determines may pose unreasonable risk. However, TSCA's cumbersome regulatory structure and its high legal evidentiary standards have proven difficult for EPA to use to obtain the information it needs to effectively assess and control toxic chemicals. While TSCA authorizes EPA to review existing chemicals, it generally provides no specific requirement, time frame, or methodology for doing so. Significantly, chemical companies are not required to develop and submit toxicity information to EPA on existing chemicals unless the agency finds that a chemical may present an unreasonable risk of injury to human health or the environment. This structure places the burden primarily on EPA to demonstrate that a chemical poses a risk rather than on the company that produces it <coughs> to demonstrate it is safe. The procedures EPA must follow to obtain test data from companies can take from two to ten years and hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars to complete. As a result, in 30 years of TSCA, EPA has used its authorities for only about 200 of the roughly 80,000 existing chemicals to require testing. Moreover, TSCA does not require chem chemical companies to do toxicity tests for the approximately 700 new chemicals introduced into commerce annually, and companies generally do not voluntarily provide such testing. In contrast, the European Union's control legislation called REACH generally places the burden on companies to provide health effects data on the chemicals they produce. Our reports include recommendations that the Congress consider giving EPA more authority to obtain data from the companies producing chemicals, and that remains one of the most viable options for improving the effectiveness of TSCA in our opinion. While TSCA authorizes EPA to issue regulations that may, among other things, limit the production or use of toxic chemicals or ban their use, the statutory requirements, the, the statute requires uh, EPA must meet to do is, is so, uh, to do so uh, presents a legal threshold that has proven difficult for EPA 
and discourage the agency from using these authorities. For example, EPA must demonstrate unreasonable risk, which requires it to conduct extensive cost-benefit analysis to ban or limit chemical production. Since 1976, EPA has issued regulations to control only five existing chemicals. And one of these, a 1989 regulation phasing out uh, most uses of asbestos was vacated by the federal courts in 1991 because it did not meet the test of substantial evidence. In contrast, the European Union and a number of other countries have banned asbestos, a known human carcinogen that can cause lung cancer and other diseases. GAO has previously recommended and continues to believe that Congress should consider amending TSCA to reduce the evidentiary burden EPA must meet to regulate toxic substances. EPA has also lim limited ability to provide the public with information on chemical production and risk because TSCA's prohibitions on the disclosure of confidential business information. About 95 percent of the required notices companies have provided to EPA on new chemicals contain some information claimed as confidential. Evaluating the appropriateness of confidentiality claims is time consuming and resource intensive and as a result, EPA does not challenge most claims. State environmental agencies and others have told us that information claimed as confidential would help them in such activities as better preparing emergency response personnel to deal with high toxic substances at manufacturing facilities in their localities. The European Union's chemical control law generally provides greater public access to chemical information it receives. GAO has previously recommended that Congress consider providing EPA additional authorities to make more chemical information publicly available. In numerous reports over the past several years, we have recommended both statutory and regulatory changes to, among other things, strengthening EPA's authority to obtain additional information from the chemical industry, shift more of the burden to chemical companies for demonstrating the safety of their chemicals, and enhance the public's understanding of the risk of chemicals to which they may be exposed. But little has changed. As a result, in January 2009, we added EPA's processes for assessing and controlling toxic chemicals to GAO's list of high-risk programs in need of broad-based transformation. This list is updated every two years and released at the start of each new Congress to help in setting oversight agendas. Mr. Chairman, we applaud you for holding this hearing and hope it is a first step toward bringing much-needed changes to the way we control toxic chemicals in this country. That concludes my summary, and I will be happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. And the Chair now recognizes Mr. Davies for the purposes of five minutes of opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jay Clarence Davies. I am a senior advisor to Will the project please pull the Emerging Nanotechnologies more you, please? At, uh, please. Uh, at the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars <coughs> and a senior fellow at Resources for the Future. The opinions expressed here are my personal opinions and do not represent the views of those organizations or their funders. I commend the subcommittee for holding this hearing. The committee's focus on TSCA is timely because of changes taking place both at the state level and internationally. States are increasingly taking the initiative to deal with toxics. Internationally, the European Union's launch of the REACH Directive has radically changed the requirements for marketing chemicals in Europe. The huge impact of technologies that were unknown when TSCA was enacted adds to the importance of reviewing TSCA now. I have followed TSCA from its inception. In 1969, I wrote a book which called for a law regulating new chemicals, and in 1970, I wrote the original version of what became TSCA. In the past several years, I have written three reports on oversight of nanotechnology. Each of them is relevant to the subject of this hearing, and I would like permission to submit them for the record. So granted. Thank you. Before dealing with TSCA's weaknesses, let me note some of its strengths. First is the broadness and potential flexibility of the law. Its coverage is not limited to any one part of the environment, a definite asset because most chemicals are not limited to air or water or land. <coughs> um, TSCA also allows EPA to choose among a broad range of measures to control chemical risks. Another strength is, is TSCA's reporting mechanisms. Section 8E, which requires manufacturers to immediately notify EPA of new risk information, is particularly important. I believe that the general cost-benefit framework of TSCA needs to be preserved. The law deals with products, not with pollutants. Commercial products, by definition, have benefits, so limiting their use or banning them to prevent adverse effects 
almost always has costs. This fact makes an absolute safety standard unwise because the government would be forced to ban chemicals that do more good than harm. Many of the good things in Tosca are undermined by the procedural landmines in the Act. The Act contains difficult, perhaps impossible, requirements that must be met before a chemical can be regulated. For example, EPA must show that the regulation is less burdensome than any alternative. All the requirements must be supported by substantial evidence in the rulemaking record, an extraordinarily high legal criterion. These provisions make it practically impossible for EPA to regulate existing chemicals. Equally damaging is Tosca's implicit assumption that no knowledge or no data is equivalent to no risk. Most of the new chemical notices contain no testing information. However, as the chairman mentioned, uh, if EPA lacks the information to evaluate the risks of a chemical, the agency cannot get the information without showing that the chemical may present an unreasonable risk. It's a classic catch-22 uh, and badly needs to be changed. Confidential business information is a third problem area. A very large portion of information submitted under the Act is classified as confidential. The Act prohibits sharing of confidential information with states or with foreign governments. The result is that Tosca is less conducive to state, federal, and international cooperation than any other environmental statute. EPA estimates that it receives notice of about 50 nanomaterials under Tosca's new chemical provisions. Because Tosca defines a chemical only by its molecular structure and does not consider size, many, perhaps most, nanomaterials are considered existing chemicals, not new ones. This is important because the Tosca provisions relating to existing chemicals have mostly been rendered inoperative. Also, because size is a defining factor for nanomaterials, EPA cannot be sure which new chemicals are nanomaterials, even though the risks of nanomaterials may be quite distinctive, distinct from bulk uh, materials. There is a general issue of the capability of the existing regulatory systems to deal with the new technologies that are emerging at an accelerating pace. Nanotechnology is one example. Another is synthetic biology, which Tosca also has jurisdiction over in part. A particular challenge for EPA will be its ability to assess the risks of future complex synthetic organisms that have no counterpart in nature, and Tosca does not provide adequate authority or, to or tools to address those kinds of risks. I urge this committee to devote some time and effort to considering what new oversight and regulatory approaches are needed to deal with 21st century science and technology. Considering Tosca's effectiveness is a step in the right direction, but over the long run, we are going to need whole new approaches to deal with the new technologies. Thank you. The Chair, thanks to the gentleman. And now, uh, I've been told by the subcommittee staff of a new procedure, especially as it relates to the oversight aspects of these hearings, and that is that I am supposed to swear in all the witnesses. So I'm going to swear, ask the witnesses to please stand, to be sworn in, and I'm going to ask those that you testified whether or not you want to keep your testimony consistent pre-swearing in as as a, the same as post swearing in. So if you didn't lie before, then excuse me for saying that. I shouldn't have said that. Last we just want you to be consistent in your testimony, <laughs> both prior to the swearing in and after the swearing in. Uh, <clears throat> do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, I do. Everybody say I do? OK. Please let the record, please have a seat. Please let the record reflect that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. And now our next witness will be Ms. Swanson for the purposes of opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Radonovich. My name is Maureen Swanson, and I direct the Healthy Children Project for the Learning Disabilities Association of America. I also am here on behalf of the Organizations of the Learning and Developmental Disabilities Initiative, which I have described in my written testimony. I'd like to explain the connection between neurodevelopmental disabilities and the need to reform TOSCA. Certain diseases and disorders, are inc including neurodevelopmental disorders, are increasing among American children. 
This is particularly true of autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. On average, it costs twice as much to educate a child with a neurodevelopmental disability as it does to educate a child who does not have these disabilities. A growing body of scientific evidence shows that some of this increase is due to exposures to toxic chemicals. Most recently, a study, uh, researchers at the University of California found that a large portion of the increase in the state's autism cases is most likely due to toxic chemical exposures. Children are especially vulnerable to toxic chemicals. Uh, relative to, their, to adults, children eat more, drink more, and breathe more. They spend a lot of time on the ground, and they put things in their mouths. From conception to early childhood is a time of rapid brain development, uh, a time when even a tiny dose of a toxic chemical can cause neurological problems that last a lifetime. Of the 80,000 chemicals registered under TSCA, about 3,000 are produced at more than a million pounds a year. Of these 3,000 chemicals, we know for certain that 10 are neurotoxins. They affect brain development. We have good evidence that another 200 are neurotoxins. But we don't have better information or more information because there is no requirement under TSCA to test chemicals for, for effects on brain development. Isn't it right for parents to assume that the government will protect their children from toxic chemical exposures? When I talk to people and they find out that the vast majority of chemicals uh, used in products are not tested for health effects, first they are dumbfounded, <laughs> and then they are outraged. I share that outrage. Uh, as the mother of a two-year-old and a four-year-old, uh, I know how hard it is to figure out which shampoos and sippy cups and toys are safest for my kids. No parent should have to stand in front of a store shelf full of toys and guess which ones have toxic constituents. And none of us should have to pay a premium for a specially made non-toxic product. No one should have to buy their way out of health risks to their children. LDA began its focus on neurotoxins decades ago by supporting efforts to get lead out of gasoline. Once lead was removed from gasoline, blood lead levels in American children dropped dramatically. At the same time, IQ levels increased. Another LDA concern is chemicals that are endocrine disruptors. Um, particularly those that affect the thyroid gland, which is essential for healthy brain development. These chemicals are often found in plastics and in include phthalates, bisphenol A, dioxins, and brominated flame retardants. I would like to thank Congress for its bipartisan support of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, which will keep lead and phthalates out of children's products. This is a crucial step toward preventing toxic chemical exposures. Tosca, on the other hand, uh, demands that the government prove beyond all reasonable doubt that a chemical is toxic after it has been put on the market, after it has infiltrated our homes and our bodies. We need legislation that requires manufacturers to prove that a chemical is safe before it can be used in products and before it can put our children at risk. We know that a preventive policy works. Lead is just one example. Uh, Clopyrifos is another. Clopyrifos is a widely used pesticide and a neurotoxin. Since EPA banned its residential use in 2001, a study in New York City showed that levels of clopyrifos in maternal and umbilical cord blood have decreased by a factor of 10. And the newborns in the study showed an increase in birth weight and length, which are measures of healthy development. To stem the rising incidence of childhood diseases such as asthma, autism, and cancer, we need a preventive approach to toxic chemical policy that requires manufacturers to test chemicals for health effects, including neurodevelopmental effects, and prohibits the use of toxic chemicals that can harm the developing fetus, infants, and children. For more than 30 years, TSCA has uh, enabled the chemical industry to take risks with our children's health that no parent would ever knowingly permit. We urge Congress to reform TSCA without further delay and provide all our children the opportunity to lead healthier and fuller lives. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next witness is Mr. Cecil Corman Mark. Mr. Mark, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning. I want to thank uh, Chairman Rush for his leadership on uh, this committee and in bringing this issue to the forefront. I also want to uh, recognize and thank uh, Mr. Rodanovich and likewise to all the other distinguished members who are present and here today. And lastly, I want to thank the committee staff for their dedication and professionalism. 
So why is a guy from Harlem here to talk to you about Toxic Substances Chemical Act? Um, quite simply because I've been impacted by chemicals and my family has and some of my neighbors have. Two quick stories. I can remember a long ago time when my mother brought home a chemical curtain uh, that I later found out was a chemical curtain, but a curtain filled with superheroes imprinted on it. And I couldn't wait to actually take a shower with uh, that chemical uh, curtain. I wanted to be in that shower at, because I thought the superheroes would transfer their powers to me and I could join their ranks. Instead, what happened was I came out dizzy, uh, unsure of what was happening, and filled with a really piercing headache. The next story is about my son, the pride and joy of my life. I'm a doting dad, and my son is in school in New York City and is playing on a basketball team. I'm across the country at a conference in San Francisco, and his mom calls to say that they've had to rush him to the hospital for an asthma attack at a visiting school. In talking to him later that day, I asked him, what do you remember? What happened? How did this happen? And after pressing him, he realized one thing that he did remember was the smell of pesticides in the visiting locker room, a visiting team's locker room. I, I want to share with you that I think that uh, in places like the community that I live and work in, Harlem, New York, um, many people are exposed to toxics. I live in, uh, as I said, Harlem, and it's a community of 7.4 seven square miles and is home to more than 650,000 mostly low and middle income African Americans and Latinos. It's known for its richly diverse population and cultural history, and the, but the area also bears disproportionate rates of disease, air pollution, and toxic exposures. Northern Manhattan leads the nation in asthma hospitalizations, low birth weight, and lead poisoning to name a few, and diabetes and obesity are also raging epidemics in our communities. High levels of public assistance in our neighborhoods are a part of the fabric, and residents often don't have health insurance. And while downtown Manhattan may be known for Broadway, the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, and other iconic landmarks uptown, our neighborhoods have auto body shops, dry cleaners, co-located with residential apartments, diesel bus depots across the street from parks and bedroom windows. And likewise, nail salons and dollar stores with many products that contain ingredients capable of disrupting a woman or a man's reproductive system uh, abound in northern Manhattan. While I'm describing my hometown, I could be talking about any place in Texas, Michigan, Louisiana, Ohio, Georgia, you name the state. And you might conclude that because these facilities or stores are located in our uh, neighborhoods that uh, we not, that doesn't necessarily mean that we might be impacted by chemicals, but I assure you, you could be wrong. I want to just point out a couple of studies. One of them from the New York Research Public Interest Group that a couple of years ago, done a couple of years ago, that documented while upstate is the major agriculture production area for New York State, it's in New York City that the greatest tons of poundage of pesticides are actually used. And they're applied to public buildings like schools or hospitals. Another one, the New York State Department of Health conducted a study in East Harlem and found high levels of PERC in apartments where dry cleaners were co-located. PERC is a volatile organic compound with many health effects that moves easily through walls and easily enters the bloodstream. The Columbia Mailman School of Children's Environmental Health Center that we co-partner with uh, conducted studies that looked at 700 mother children peers and examined dust samples in their homes and found high levels of pesticides like chloropyphosis and diazinon, which transfer readily to the fetus. And these were found to reduce birth weight by an average of 6.6 .6 ounces. And furthermore, high prenatal exposure to pesticides like chlorpyrifosis was found to be associated with psychomotor uh, cognitive delay and attentional disorders at age three. Early findings from another study projected that the same cohort uh, is indicating dibutyl phthalate is commonly found in perfumes is staying in mo mother's bodies longer than thought. Toxic chemicals don't belong in people. And while researchers don't have all the answers to what the health effects are, environmental justice advocates are mobilizing to fix what we see as a flawed chemical system. Um, what are the problems in this system? I mean, there are many, and I have submitted them in my testimony. I urge you to read them. But we need a comprehensive regulatory reform for toxic chemicals, and I ask you to help us in making that possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final witness uh, for the purpose of opening statements is Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright, you're recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Chairman Rush, and thank you, Ranking Member Radanovich, uh, for the opportunity to testify before you this morning. My name is Mike Wright. I'm the Director of Health, Safety, and Environment for the United Steel, Paper, and Forestry, Rubber, Manufacturing, Energy, Allied Industrial and Service Workers International Union, and I promise not to use the full name again. Um, we're the USW for short. We represent 850,000 workers in the sectors I just mentioned and many others, including a majority of unionized workers in the chemical industry and hundreds of thousands of workers who use industrial chemicals in the job. My written statement details my background. Let me just say I've been dealing with chemical issues for more than 30 years, both within my union and internationally, primarily through several United Nations organizations. I'll talk this morning about one mission that affected me the most and that still haunts me to this day. I was a member of an international team which traveled to Bhopal, India to investigate the December 1984 methyl isocyanate release from a union carbide plant that took several thousand lives, nobody knows how many, in the first few hours and many more in subsequent weeks and continues to claim victims at a rate of one or two a week, even a quarter century later. In my sleep, I still see the faces of parents whose, children's, whose children died. I still see children left without parents. I can still hear the constant coughing of victims who survived but with most of their lungs burned away. Two members of that team were from the U.S. And one thing we quickly realized was had the Bhopal plant existed in the United States, none of the underlying causes of the accident, none of them, would have violated any OSHA or EPA or any other regulation. And that includes the Toxic Substances Control Act, even though TSCA was then in force. Think about that for a minute. The Toxic Substances Control Act wouldn't have controlled the causes, much less prevented, the worst toxic substance accident in human history. Much has changed since then. We have a, law, a lot of laws and regulations which chip at the edges. Um, but the basic chemical safety law in this country, TSCA, the cornerstone on which everything else rests, remains unchanged. Let me turn to the impact of TSCA, or rather the lack of impact in the workplace. I'm wearing a little lapel pin this morning. It's a tiny birdcage with a canary. Thousands of our members and many of our supporters wear them. It symbolizes what workers have become in relation to toxic chemicals. Before the invention of modern testing equipment, miners used to bring canaries underground. If the bird died, you knew something in the air was toxic and you got out. Today, we are the canaries in those cages. Others might testify as time goes on in these, in these activities about things like bisphenol A, phthalates, carbon nanotubes. All of them may pose serious risk to consumers and communities, but we are the first to be exposed, and we are usually the highest exposed. Most epidemiology regarding toxic substances uses cohorts of workers. In other words, it's our bodies that get counted in these retrospective human experiments. My colleagues and I in the USW's Health, Safety, and Environment Department visit several hundred workplaces a year in all manner of industries. Collectively, we have a lot of experience with chemicals and chemical hazards, so our members depend on us to say whether what they're working with is safe. Too often, we don't have a clue. OSHA requires labels and written information sheets for workplace chemicals, but they frequently contain almost no useful information beyond acute toxicity because the chemicals have never been tested for any other effects. Too often we learn the consequences of that ignorance only by chance and only too late. My written testimony includes several examples of chemicals found to be dangerous only because the men and women using them on the job died or became critically ill. And they're only the very small tip of a very large iceberg. The dangers of these chemicals were, were discovered only through unusual circumstances like rare medical conditions, an overwhelming number of deaths, or a chance discussion by workers. We have no idea how many more untested chemicals are causing unrecognized illness among workers and consumers. In short, the way we now evaluate many potentially toxic chemicals is by counting bodies and measuring human misery long after those chemicals have been introduced. That has to change. Let me turn for a minute to economics. Of course, the main reason for reforming TSCA is to prevent human health, but there are also good economic reasons. There will be many who say that we can't afford to reform chemical policy, especially not in the current economic climate. In truth, we can't afford not to. First, there is the economic burden of occupational disease and environmental disease, which I discuss in my written statement. It saps, it saps our productivity, destroys the earning potential of our families, increases health care costs. Then there is the issue of competitiveness. 
Europe has adopted a strong new system called REACH, and it's been mentioned earlier this morning, designed to assure that chemicals and products made with, chemical, made with chemicals are safe to manufacture and use. Unless the United States follows suit, consumers will ultimately come to trust European products more than they trust American products. I believe it was the great consumer advocate Esther Peterson who said, made in USA should be a guarantee, not a warning. I have great faith in the chemical industry. Our members work in the chemical industry. I actually believe all those Sunday morning commercials about the human element and the innovative potential of American chemistry. I believe we can produce chemical products that are safe to manufacture and safe to use. Thousands of our members work in the industry. They want to make things that are safe for them, safe for their kids, safe for the planet. They know that in the long run, their jobs depend on that as well. The critical first step is the reform of our basic chemical safety law, TSCA. Mr. Chairman, you, your committee, and this Congress can make that happen. We urge you to do so, and I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you very much, and we thank uh, all the witnesses.